Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Noir Histoire. I'm Natasha, and in this episode, I'll be sharing what I've learned about the Wilmington Coup, also known as the Wilmington Insurrection or the Wilmington Massacre. It occurred on November 10th, 1898. It's a notable coup d'etat massacre location, Wilmington, North Carolina. In 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which among other things freed those who were enslaved within the rebel states. When Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant in 1865, it theoretically ended the American Civil War, though the war didn't officially end until a proclamation was issued by President Johnson in 1866. During Reconstruction, the period of 1865 to 1877, the Confederacy was dissolved and slavery was officially abolished throughout the United States. Efforts were made to integrate the former Confederate states and the newly freed into the Union. Additional amendments were ratified with the intent of establishing the criteria for and the rights of citizenship for the newly emancipated. The formerly enslaved began to acquire property, sought education, and established businesses. Now citizens, black men had been granted the right to vote. The large concentration of black people in the South created the potential for powerful voting blocks in some areas. Bitter from losing the war and still clinging to ideas of white supremacy, some Southern white people were angered by these changes. When federal troops were withdrawn from the South, it signaled the end of Reconstruction. In the years that followed, communities across the South began to implement new laws and policies aimed at limiting the rights of black people. This was combined with oppressive social practices to effectively create a new form of quasi-slavery. In some areas, violence and acts of terrorism were used to reinforce these efforts to subjugate black people. Wilmington, North Carolina was one such place. A former Confederate general and soldiers became the police chief and police officers in Wilmington mere months after the Civil War. The police force had no black officers and regularly brutalized the city's black residents. Despite these hostilities, black citizens exercised their right to vote, which helped elect multiple black men for public office. Fueled in part by recognizing their shared interests, white farmers in the Populist Party and black Republicans formed a political coalition within North Carolina. This group of fusionists, as they were called, made a pact to not run candidates against each other during elections of the 1890s. By combining their votes, they outnumbered those of the Democrats, the party of the white supremacy until the mid-1900s. The increasing political power and financial success of black residents, along with there being several black public servants, angered Democrats. They viewed this progress as Negro domination. Over the course of several months, white supremacists plotted the demise of black progress throughout North Carolina. A campaign of disinformation was carried out via newspaper articles, political cartoons, and speeches. They utilized the often repeated claim of black men raping white women and cast black people's aspiration for greater political power as a ploy to increase black men's access to white women. Politicians and other speechmakers called for white men to do all that was possible, including committing acts of violence, to ensure the election of Democrats. The Red Shirts, a group similar to the KKK, roamed on horseback terrorizing black people in communities. They placed particular focus on those who voted or were otherwise politically active. On election day, they stopped black neighborhoods armed with guns. This led to low black voter turnout across the state, allowing Democrats to win key races. By 1898, Wilmington was prosperous with a slight majority black population and a growing black middle class. The black men who held political office wouldn't be up for re-election until the following year, and thus this city especially drew the attention of white supremacists. Alexander Manley, a city resident and owner of the Wilmington Daily Record, responded to a speech that called for lynchings to prevent these white-on-black rapes, or these alleged white-on-black rapes. He stated that this supposed epidemic of black men raping white women was unfounded. It was more likely that sexual contact between the two groups was consensual. He also pointed at the hypocrisy of these outraged white men, as they were more accurately describing themselves and the crimes they committed against black people, black women in particular. Alfred Moore Waddle was one of the politicians who had called for violence against black voters. On November 10th, two days after the state elections, he and several hundred white men armed themselves with a Gatling gun and other weapons and entered Wilmington. The mob promptly burned down the Daily Record offices, though fortunately Manley had already left town. In the months leading up to this event, some stores had declined to sell guns to black people. Some went so far as to record which black people had attempted to purchase weapons. The city's 10 black police officers had been pushed out of the department. 
Now painting the situation as black residents rioting, members of the mob push for the governor to send in the state militias. The mob, now reinforced by the local police force and other government forces, moved through town destroying property and attacking and killing black people as they went. Waddell and some of the mob invaded City Hall and forced the democratically elected members of the local government to resign at gunpoint. Largely unarmed and outgunned, many black residents were forced to flee and hid in the wilderness outside the city. Thousands would leave the city completely, relocating elsewhere. The exact number of casualties is unknown, but estimates are in the range of 14 to tens or hundreds. It's believed that some bodies were dumped in the nearby river or otherwise destroyed. The incident resulted in the black population becoming the minority within the city. Waddell was declared the city's mayor later in the day, completing the coup d'etat. Within a few years, a grandfather clause and other laws were implemented to restrict black voting rights. Coupled with new Jim Crow laws, black people were once again relegated to being treated as second-class citizens. In the years that followed, the events of November 10, 1898 would be referred to as the Wilmington Riot or Wilmington Incident. Waddell and other members of the mob were portrayed as heroes, particularly within North Carolina. Their attack on Wilmington was openly discussed with pride until public opinion and open violent acts of white supremacy began to change in the 1900s. At that point, the incident was simply less discussed. It wasn't until around the time of the event's centennial that the true story of what took place began to be discussed publicly, though it still remains less widely known. Thanks for tuning in. Show notes and sources are available on the Noir Histoire website by the link in the episode description. I'm working on creating downloadables and infographics, so keep an eye on the website. These Black History Facts are released every Wednesday, so if you enjoyed this episode and want more, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my Black History Facts playlist.